Once again, having, Heavenly Father, it is our privilege and honor to study the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit take the things which we look at this evening and make them a source of challenge to each believer. And I pray that there may be definite obedience on the part of each one of us to fulfill the responsibility which we have been given by God the Holy Spirit as members of the Church Universal and this local congregation in Jesus' name. Amen. We're dealing with uh, Roman numeral 5, uh, the purpose of the church. Why is the church in existence? Remember that the universal church, the church with a capital C, is made up of all believers, regardless of what stripe they are as far as denomination or or theological bent, if they're born again by faith in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, they're a part of the universal church, the church which is called the body of Christ, which is called the royal family of God. And that's the, this is what we're talking about, the purpose of the universal church. However, the universal church, and we'll study it under the principle of the organization of the local church in a few moments or maybe a few days I don't know how soon we'll get to it but the point being that the universal church is commanded not to forsake the assembling of themselves together this is not an uh, this is therefore not a a matter of uh, personal uh, preference it isn't a matter of whether we want to or not we're commanded to meet together in what is called a local church, though denominations are specifically not taught in the Bible, and one person over more than one local church is also not taught in the Bible. Now, the local church and the universal church is made up of five major divisions. You have uh, uh, spiritual believers, that is, believers who are filled with or controlled by God the Holy Spirit. Uh, described for us uh, 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 in many passages of Scripture. And these are actually under three categories. You have spiritual babes in Christ, those who are newborn Christians or who have never grown. Uh, they're described in 1 Peter 2.2. 2. And then you have uh, spiritual adolescents. They're believers who know a little but think they know a lot. And uh, uh, they're usually a pain in the neck. If you, can, if you can live with them for a while, they may grow up. They're described in 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. Then you have the spiritually mature believers uh, who are described in 1 John chapter 2, verse 3. These, uh, pardon me, verse 13. This is 12 and 13. Uh, these people are uh, believers who have advanced into spiritual adulthood. But that's only three of the group. You also have carnal believers. That is, believers who are controlled by their old sin nature uh, for a specific period of time, a short period of time, and then those who are controlled by their old sin nature for an extended period of time, which is called reversionistic believers, or the world calls them backslidden, but... They're really reversionists because they don't slide back. They turn around and, and direct uh, uh, their life in another direction. The carnal believer is described in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1, and the reversionistic believer is described in Galatians chapter 5, verse 4. Now, actually, only these here are prepared to fulfill the purpose of the local church. What is the church here for? And we start, began by noting the principle, uh, the first purpose of the church is to evangelize the world. And we have uh, studied uh, uh, Matthew chapter 28, uh, verses 18 and 19 in relationship to that. Uh, the principle of baptizing people uh, requires that they be evangelized and respond positively to it. Uh, there are other passages. We also looked at Acts chapter 1, verse 8, 
and we have uh, referred to Mark 16:15, though it is not really in the original. Uh, the last half of the of Mark 16 is not in the original Greek, where it says, "Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature." There is also the passage found in Luke 24, verses 46 to 48. And this means, therefore, that it is the responsibility of the church to evangelize. This doesn't mean that it's only the responsibility of believers who have the spiritual gift of evangelism. Now, those who have the gift of evangelism are actually missionaries, uh, for the most part, uh, and they're missionaries in one part of the world or another. They can be missionaries in the United States. They can be missionaries... Uh, in foreign lands, but they have the gift of making the gospel clear uh, wherever they are. And uh, therefore, we usually categorize them as missionaries uh, in this dispensation and uh, because of the fact that uh, the other uh, uh, gift of evangelism uh, is, is not uh, actually operating as far as People, individual members of the royal family going around having a special gift for evangelism uh, too often. There are a few people who have the gift of being able to evangelize wherever they are. But uh, what is uh, evangelization? What is the responsibility of the church? It's simply this. It is to present the gospel clearly succinctly and uh, uh, leaving it with the Lord and not putting pressure on people to uh, believe, not uh, a soul winning, uh, which you have heard uh, down through the years. Uh, uh, these are not, that's not the presentation of the gospel. Uh, the uh, every believer has this responsibility. Now that means that you need to know what the gospel is. But it does not mean that you necessarily need to worry about knowing a lot of other things that in order for you to make the gospel clear. There are people who are confused and confounded uh, about what they need to know in order for them to witness. In other words, they aren't going to witness to their doctor because the doctor is so much beyond their education, so they don't feel that they should witness to their doctor. Wrong. Uh, you have every, every re right and every responsibility to uh, influence anybody that you can, and using every opportunity that you can to give out the gospel. Uh, we were cleaning out the garage. Uh, I shouldn't say we. That uh, means I was helping. Uh, Jan was cleaning out the garage uh, over the weekend. She was laboring. And uh, she ran across a uh, booklet that I had prepared many, many years ago for uh, the uh, when we were in another location in, in this city. And um, I, therefore prepared it, uh, and I took it and presented it at a pastor's conference, and I uh, was barbecuing something at the grill, and I picked up one of these things, and I said, you know something? After I read it, there's not one thing in this book that isn't absolutely correct, 100% right, when I first wrote it, and as it is, as it stands today. Now, it was written with the concept of how that particular building and location could be used for evangelism and outreach. The problem is that our people never, ever captured the vision or had the desire to take advantage of the facility. And I feel, and I brought, I had it brought in tonight, I want you all to take one with you because the principles that are outlined in this book and some of the ideas that are in this little booklet 
are just as valid today as they were when we when I first wrote them uh, and it has to be uh, 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 a number of years ago because uh, we've been uh, we were two years uh, across the uh, there and one year down at the uh, uh, the sharing so it has to be at least three uh, to five uh, or se uh, seven years uh, ago but uh, uh, one of the things I noted is that uh, we need to begin to learn to see the invisible the Lord Jesus Christ saw the invisible uh, when I was a camp director, I was amazed at how people could uh, not see what was very obvious to, to me, particularly the staff. By that I mean uh, I could see every paper that was laying on the ground. My staff could walk over it and never, ever see it. And I never could understand that. And then I read an article in Reader's Digest at one time about how the woman who has a messy house doesn't see it that way. She thinks it's fine. And uh, uh, somebody who has a different kind of house walks into a situation like that, and they're appalled at how terribly filthy it is. But the person himself or herself doesn't see it. Uh, they just are they're looking right past it. And to someone else, it is an abomination. Uh, now, I'm not talking about being so fastidious that you can't find one or two things out of place uh, without being nervous about it. So f fastidious, so, so uh, uh, clean that you, you could eat off the floor. I'm not talking about that kind of thing. I'm just talking about a clutter, uh, things that are cluttered up that are invisible to people. Well... Uh, I used to lecture the staff on picking up garbage, picking up trash, picking up papers that were lying on the ground. Don't walk over an ice cream wrapper. Uh, pick it up. Uh, don't walk over a straw that you see lying up. Pick it up and throw it in the trash. And it didn't do any good because those things were invisible to my staff. They didn't see them. But to me, as the director, everything was obvious. Uh, people don't see things, and people don't see the invisible. The disciples didn't see the invisible. Turn in your Bible to the fourth chapter of the Gospel of John for a moment. Our Lord Jesus Christ is the example for us in the church age. In this fourth chapter of the Gospel of John... Uh, we read in verse 4, now he had to go through Samaria. We have to stop before we go on and say that that statement is not true uh, because of a geographic necessity. It wasn't true because uh, uh, of the fact that uh, there was no other way to go. It was true because that's what was true of him. For, you see, uh, uh, the provinces of Judea, the southern province, the central province of Maria, and the northern par province of Galilee were located, of course, uh, adjacent to each other. But if a Jew were to go from Galilee to Judea or Judea to Galilee, he would never go through Samaria. Samaria was made up of the half-breeds, for you see, when the second deportation, uh, when the first of the of the di five, five cy fifth cycle of this first time the fifth cycle of discipline was administered to the nation of Israel in 721 B.C. by the northern uh, uh, by the uh, kingdom of Assyria to the northern kingdom uh, known as uh, Israel, uh, everything all the people were taken out. Uh, to uh, Damascus and uh, Samaria, Assyria, and the area was repopulated by the Gentiles. Uh, these uh, uh, Jews then uh, married, uh, inter uh, uh, these Gentiles intermarried with the Jews who were still left from Judea who went back to repopulate the land. They had an exodus, they had, uh, had an exodus to Judea, to Judah, the southern kingdom. 
uh, at that time. And after the deportation, they went back. And here were these uh, Gentiles, and they intermarried with them and formed a group of half-breeds, half-Jewish and half-Gentile. And because they were not allowed to worship uh, in Judah and in Jerusalem uh, at the temple, therefore they, uh, they had their own worship uh, in Samaria. Uh, and uh, 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 they were uh, outcasts. Nobody talked to them. The Jews wouldn't have anything to do with them, and the Gentiles wouldn't have anything to do with them. So therefore, if a person were to go from Galilee to Judea, uh, he would go across the River Jordan, down on Perea, the side of Perea. This was the area known as Perea. And then across over here. And when they went back, they went the same way. They didn't go through Samaria because they didn't want to have anything to do with these people. And yet, the Lord Jesus Christ had to go through Samaria. And the reason, because there were known to him in his humanity, now we're not talking about his deity, but in his humanity, he knew very well that there were people here who needed to hear about the Lord Jesus Christ. As far as the rest of the Jews are concerned, though they were sent to witness to the truth of Yahweh and salvation by grace through uh, faith in Yahweh, nevertheless, they were so bogged down in religion that they couldn't do that. Now notice verse 5. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Joseph's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. Now, we understand at this point that the disciples were not with him. They had gone into the city itself, to uh, apparently to uh, obtain provisions. And they're not there. They don't return till verse 27. But he sat down at the well of Samaria. Now, uh, two reasons, of course. He was thirsty. But in addition, he also knew that this was the gathering place for anybody from the city who needed water. They didn't have a tap to turn on. They didn't have individual wells in their backyards. They came to this deep well, and they would uh, draw water in their, uh, their uh, earthenware containers and carry them back. Most of the women could carry them back on their head. That was a, a common oriental custom. But anyway, uh, in verse 7, a Samaritan woman comes and he, uh, he enters into this conversation with her. And uh, you'll notice how startled she is. He says, will you give me a drink? And then we read in verse 8 that his disciples had gone to the town to buy food. So he was alone. Now the Samaritan woman is shocked. She says, you are a Jew, recognized his clothing immediately. And I am a Samaritan and a woman. Two things. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Then the Lord Jesus Christ uh, says, if, it, if you knew who it was who, uh, uh, that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. And uh, then, of course, the conversation goes on. But I'm not, I, I'm not dealing with how he does it. Uh, how he deals with her, or what he actually says. But I want you to notice, uh, um, now the disciples come back in verse 27. And they were surprised to find him talking with a woman. Uh, but no one asked, what do you want, or why are you talking with her? You don't question the chief. But see, they, to, her, to, to them, she was invisible. She could have, he would, they would have passed her a hundred times and never ever thought of stopping and engaging her in a conversation. But she left her water jars, went back to town and said to the people, verse 29, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be Messiah? They came out of, their town, of the town and made their way toward him. Uh, meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. They left him. He was exhausted. But he said, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. He was invigorated from his fulfillment of the, the purpose for which he was here, to evangelize. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. Uh, this, his disciples said, uh, could they have brought him some food? And 
He said, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say there are four months more and then the harvest? I'm telling you something. Open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now the reaper draws his wages. And uh, he probably at this very moment, you see the group of people in verse uh, 20, uh, 30 are making their way from the city toward this well, uh, down the hillside, uh, down the small mountainside. And uh, uh, this woman is leading a large contingent of people. And uh, they're coming down. And he, he, he perhaps uh, uh, pointed to them as he said, uh, uh, the, the fields are even now ripe for harvest. Even now the reaper draws his wages. Even now he harvests the crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Uh, you know, verse 30, I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefit of their labor. And this is true probably of all of us of this dispensation. The work of God has been done. The Holy Spirit is working uh, uh, in many, many ways, using His Word and preparing the hearts of people. Now, verse 39, Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in Him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to Him, they urged Him to stay with them. And He stayed for two days. And because of His words, many more believe, uh, became believers. And they said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. Uh, an invisible woman, as far as the men are concerned, uh, uh, turn to uh, uh, Luke chapter 5. Here's another invisible man. Uh, uh, this is an invisible man, another invisible person. Beginning in verse 27. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up and left everything and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house. And a large crowd of tax collectors, all people he knew were tax collectors, and uh, others of that of the polit political crowd. This would be a popular politician, a good. I mean, he was doing what uh, he was not. It's not said that Matthew ever was doing anything wrong uh, as far as uh, ta collecting taxes. He wasn't cheating people. There is another one we'll see in a moment. But this man was just collecting taxes. And uh, uh, then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to the sect complained to his disciples, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, the Lord Jesus comes out and says, Look, uh, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And, of course, all were sinners. Uh, but uh, turn to Luke 19. Here's uh, a crooked politician who was invisible. But the Lord Jesus Christ saw him. In fact, uh, he was invisible to a lot of people. Uh, Luke 19. I turned to John a little too far. I've got to get back here. Jesus entered Jericho, verse 1, and was passing through. There was a man there by the name of Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, very wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree uh, to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he stopped. He looked up. He saw an invisible man. I mean, nobody else saw him. Nobody else thought about him. But the Lord Jesus saw him sitting there up in the tree of all places. And he said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. And all the people began to mutter, uh, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, 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 
Here, now I give half my possessions to the poor, and if I've cheated anybody out of anything, first-class condition, by the way, I will pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said, today salvation has come to this house, because this man, too, is the son of Abraham. If he's going to give back four times, he certainly was uh, saved. He really was born again. Reminds me of a man, I, uh, one of the first baptisms I uh, had in my uh, church in Chicago, uh, when I was pastor at Calvary Memorial Church, was a fellow by the name of Andy Dornboss. And when he came up out of the water and he was getting out, he reached to the back and he said, Oh, my goodness, I left my wallet in my pocket when I was baptized. He said, I guess that means the Lord wants that, too. <laughs> and Andy never, never let me forget that uh, he was baptized with his wallet in his pocket. Uh, after that, we eventually got some kind of robe so that they could change into uh, uh, their swimsuit and then be baptized in a, in a robe rather than with their clothing. But uh, at that point, we didn't have anything else, <laughs> so that's how we did it. But here's a man who was, uh, was invisible, you see. Now, there, there was a woman uh, who passed by who touched the hem of his garment, and the Lord Jesus Christ stopped, and uh, he, he led her to come to that place. We, we have to understand that the Lord Jesus Christ not only saw people, but he became involved, I mean, involved with them. The Lord of glory, God the Son, uh, incarnate. Uh, the uh, the, the uh, period of time during which he was here on the earth was very limited, and he didn't come to heal the sick or to, to raise the dead though he did in order to call attention to his authority on a number of occasions. But uh, uh, generally speaking, uh, he didn't uh, do that, but he did have time to give out the gospel message. And uh, uh, now if you'll turn to Luke chapter 5. Uh, uh, Luke 5. There are three illustrations that our Lord uses here. And the point uh, is often missed. Uh, it's often missed by a lot of people when they look at this passage. First, I'm going to read the passage with you, see if you get the point, and then I'm going to, to uh, uh, bring it out to you. This is right after the calling of, uh, of Levi this, uh, and the criticism that comes from the Pharisees, the religious leaders. Verse 33, They then said to him, John's disciples often fast and pray. So do the disciples of the Pharisees. But yours go on eating and drinking. Uh, can you make the guests of the bridegroom fast, he answered, while he is with them? But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. In those days he will fa they'll fast. Verse 36, he told them this parable, this story with a point. No one tears a patch from a new garment and sews it on an old one. If he does, he'll have torn the new garment, and the patch from the new will not match the old. Verse 37, another illustration. Now, to, this is the same as the, fair, as the, the, the uh, eating and drinking parables. No difference. You'll see all three uh, fit together. Verse 37, and no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does... The new wine will burst the skins, and the wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No, new wine must be poured into new wineskins. And no one after drinking old wine wants the new, for he says the old is better. What is the point? What is he saying? See, the, the religious leaders were astounded that the Lord Jesus Christ would be interested in Le Matthew Levi. You see that? The, uh, he was one of those who religion had loathed and despised. The Lord Jesus Christ not only has fellowship with them, but he leads them to come to himself. And when they criticize him, he makes this point. Here is the point of these three parables. You can see it there. His way and the way of traditional religion are absolutely and totally diametrically opposed to one another. Now, that's the point of these things. Don't try to read into it something that isn't there. Don't try to foist upon it something that he's not saying. What he is saying is this. 
He is saying this, the Pharisees had the way of religion. He comes with a new way, and his way is different from their way. And they wouldn't have anything to do with these sinners. His way is to have something to do with them and to lead them to come to know him as their uh, uh, Savior. Uh, they, these religious leaders, brought no one new life. They brought no one uh, 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 salvation. Legalism never does. The old way of doing things. But when he comes along, uh, he brings the new wine. He brings the new garment. He brings the, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Message of Matthew chapter 11, uh, 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 28. And the point is that as members of the royal family of God with the, the uh, hypostatic union as our precedent, we look back to see our Lord Jesus Christ who sees the invisible and who brings something that religion doesn't bring, who offers what religion doesn't offer, who offers something that is new and fresh and wonderful at the, the, the breath of fresh air. And that is the new birth to anyone, anyone, anyone who will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, no one is too far gone. No one is uh, outside of the, the, uh, the uh, area of being reachable. There's nobody who has uh, passed the point of no return as long as they are alive. And uh, uh, every believer should be seeking in his life to be looking for the invisible uh, for the purpose of sharing the gospel, uh, gospel information to whomever uh, and wherever. It's just amazing how the Lord works. Uh, I, uh, uh, the Sunday morning, if you remember, uh, we had a telephone call at the beginning of Bible class, uh, and uh, uh, obviously we were already in class, and so the number was taken, and uh, uh, after class I called, uh, returned the call, a lady who, she was working at the time, and she couldn't uh, get off, and uh, she, uh, uh, she was, uh, now many times those calls come, they ask for money. Uh, but you never know, see? You never know. This lady was on the other end of the line, and she was, she, she was just totally and completely confused. She uh, was, uh, needed the Lord, and uh, uh, over the telephone, I gave her the necessary information and followed up with a packet of books that we put together in a, in a moment of time, I mean, just to, after it was all finished, put together, and we, we had it in the mail before uh, noon on Sunday, so that as soon as the mail came today, she would have all of this information that was available to her so that she could uh, go. And I said to her, tell me, uh, uh, how did you happen to call me? She said, I was just looking through the telephone directory. Now, the telephone directory is not very often used as a tool of contact. Uh, but it was in this case, and she said, I decided that uh, a Bible church would probably uh, be true to the Bible. Well, that's a pretty good guess. <laughs> it's a it's, uh, part of our name. And uh, uh, now who knows uh, what, the, what the future holds. Paul says, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. It doesn't make any difference who gets the credit for anything. Who leads uh, the person to the Lord? Uh, who uh, uh, prepares the ground? But the believer's responsibility is for us to to uh, become uh, ambassadors, ambassadors uh, of to invisible people. And uh, uh, I, uh, in this little volume, uh, I list um, um, some things. Uh, I say, uh, think of areas of people, uh, of the invisible people, uh, to which believers could be uh, uh, becoming ambassadors. Now, obviously, this doesn't mean that everyone can reach everyone. You see, that's not the point. But uh, some of these are are uh, uh, invisible because we don't think about them. We don't give any thought to them. Uh, some years ago, I, I used to run uh, um, 
classified ads in the in, in the area newspapers the the Fort Wayne papers were too expensive but in area newspapers uh, uh, starting out uh, with uh, are you divorced uh, does the church treat you like a second-class citizen uh, there's someone who would not do that uh, and uh, his name is Jesus Christ would you like to know more about this wonderful uh, God who doesn't condemn you because you're divorced and then I offered a literature uh, that uh, was available uh, and uh, sent to people we may have received half a dozen letters uh, in the mail to the uh, post office box and sent the material out never heard of anybody but you see if you start looking to count the number of people who respond you're 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 out of line because God is not uh, expecting you to count the number of souls that you have saved he does the saving. Uh, there was a time when there was a, a man who had uh, some money uh, in this town uh, who liked my broadcast and wanted to put me on uh, another station. And he, uh, he chose a station in uh, Crystal River, Florida, and we were on for about a year. And every week he would ask me how many letters did I get uh, asking for uh, material. And I, uh, I kept telling him that you can't judge the effectiveness of an outreach by the number of responses that you get but uh, uh, he paid the, for it to be on for a whole year and so I sent the tapes for a whole year at the end of the year somebody else uh, tickled his fancy and he then decided he would support uh, that ministry and uh, we went off the air in that place but we were on uh, at one time we were on in uh, Rochester New York and uh, uh, we were on in some little uh, uh, Crystal River, Florida. We were on in uh, uh, some place uh, out west. I don't even remember where it was anymore uh, for periods of time. But you can't count the number of letters that come. You don't know the people who are listening. And the gospel is, is going out wherever it goes. And we take those the opportunities as open doors to communicate the gospel. But uh, just think for a moment of uh, foreign students uh, who are visiting the United States of America, uh, who are here from countries all over the world. Uh, I want an opportunity to reach those foreign students. Uh, how do you do it? Well, uh, I know a family that uh, uh, every uh, uh, holiday, they have no place to go. And so they make it a point to invite foreign students from the universities that we and You know, we have here several schools in town foreign students who have no place to go on these holidays to their home for Thanksgiving or for Christmas or for other holidays and while they're there they treat them very graciously and do not put any pressure on them but they give them the gospel and who knows uh, uh, if they will be respond or not uh, how about uh, 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 unwed mothers uh, how about uh, 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 the uh, pregnant girls um, uh, there's a, uh, we, with an acronym, MOPS, Mothers of Preschoolers, are just dying for someone to babysit with their kids once in a while so they can get away from the little monsters and get out there and enjoy life uh, for one, one hour a week or something. Uh, who's uh, uh, ministering to uh, uh, athletes? Uh, uh, who's ministering to poli people in political life uh, uh, or public service? Uh, addicts. Uh, refugees, uh, the indigent, uh, the transients. We're grateful for the uh, Fort Wayne Rescue Mission and the work that they're doing uh, uh, down there, uh, reaching the, the, the people who come in uh, off the street. Uh, the, the women's division, tremendous uh, ministry that they have, women and a place for women and children. Uh, they're doing a great job. Uh, 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 people interested in art, uh, golden agers, Nutrition nuts. Well, there are all kinds of nutrition nuts around. Uh, the people who are in hospitals, in nursing homes, uh, singles, uh, uh, people who are uh, handicapped, people who are blind, uh, uh, who can't read, who need to have literature read to them. Uh, could not somebody uh, read uh, gospel literature instead of uh, Reader's Digest in the newspaper to them? I mean, these are just some of the ideas that uh, I suggested uh, would be uh, usable in, in order to uh, reach out
to uh, to, to the world uh, on the ba on the basis of individual believers. Okay, the, the the challenge is for you to think about your world, the world that you live in. Each of our worlds is different. We don't all live in the same world. We live in the same world, big world. But each of our worlds is entirely different from everyone else's. Can we go from uh, to, into that world day in and day out and day in and out. What are we doing to try to make known the gospel of Christ? And all of our personalities are different, so we're not going to be able to do it in the same way. We all can't be Roger Dodger the old codger. Uh, can't we just get, I can't do like Roger did. Whoa, up to somebody I've never seen in the street, and in five minutes he's got him talking about the Lord. I can't do that. I don't know how to do that. I don't try to do it. I never try to be somebody I'm not. But uh, the point is, um, I think we could uh, echo the words uh, of the old chorus that uh, we learned, Love this world through me, Lord, this world with such a need. Thou didst love in death, Lord, love through me indeed. Souls are in despair, Lord, O oh, make me know and care. When my life they see, may they behold thee. O oh, love this world through me, through me, Love this world through me. And I think we could do that as individual believers. But uh, uh, just take along one of these, and in your spare time, uh, read it. We're going to keep it, even though it's outdated uh, as far as uh, the place we're at. Uh, and we can't use the place like we could have in that time. Uh, we, I had the idea of having an aerobics class for ladies in the gymnasium of opening the gymnasium on Saturday mornings for the kids in the neighborhood uh, to come in and play basketball under the leadership of some of our men uh, and women who could uh, play with them and then gather them together to listen to a, a very brief uh, testimony uh, from one of them uh, to utilize uh, uh, the downtown location for uh, some kind of a concert that business people could listen to and uh, then get the gospel. But Needless to say, whether those things are gone, you can't change the past. And the past is gone. But the future uh, uh, is uh, always before us. And regardless of what the past is, the concepts and the ideas are here. And if you're out there and you'd like to have one of these, I'll be glad to send it to you. It's filled with biblical bases and ideas that uh, are available to you uh, to use for uh, the principle of personal uh, outreach, individual uh, outreach. And so it is that uh, uh, our responsibility as a local church is to evangelize the world. And the first is uh, through uh, the individual members of the body of Christ, believers. Certainly every believer is responsible to, to do that. Of course, the pastor teacher is responsible to evangelize those who come under the influence of his ministry within the church. And uh, we try to do that uh, in the, uh, uh, in the, the uh, Bible classes, uh, kind of through the radio, through the television. Uh, so we try to do that in the individual messages. Uh, but there is also the local church outreach and uh, the local uh, church outreach for evangelism. And what do we have? Well, we have a radio broadcast on uh, two stations. We have a TV, and by the way, uh, September has changed our times. We are now on uh, Channel 10, Tuesday night uh, at uh, 8, with uh, Kids uh, Fun, uh, Kids uh, Backyard Bible Club, and at 8.30, uh, Grace Bible Class. So uh, we are now on at a new time, at a new day. And then uh, Sunday, uh, uh, we uh, well, Saturday morning, we're on at 8 o'clock, on Channel 7 uh, in the northern DeKalb County. Uh, we're Channel 13 in uh, Steuben County, I mean in northern Allen County, uh, and Channel 14 in De DeKalb County, as well as, uh, uh, or this is Channel 5 in northern Allen County, and Channel 7 in, uh, in Auburn. And then also the same stations on Sunday morning at uh, 7.30 uh, is when we're on with the... Uh, uh, Grace Bible Class at 8 o'clock for uh, the Kids' uh, Backyard Bible Club. Uh, and these are evangelistic uh, outreaches that God has given to us. Uh, uh, whether we could take advantage of the uh, opening in uh, 
uh, Columbus, uh, Ohio, is something that we leave entirely in the hands uh, of the Lord. But uh, we also uh, try to use our kids' club. Uh, be, uh, the Tuesday night uh, is uh, uh, and the Sunday parts of the kids' club are strictly designed for teaching uh, the Word of God. But Thursday night is our evangelism night. And everything is given over on Thursday night to evangelism. And points are awarded to kids for bringing their friends. And uh, uh, that the way, that's the way they, they, they earn points. But that's the way the unsaved kids come in hear the gospel. And uh, I'm here to tell you, folks, that uh, uh, it's a thrill. It's a thrill to me to see uh, these little tads uh, coming in. And uh, you look into their wide eyes. and, and their, uh, I remember when Jenny first came. She, she was so shy she wouldn't even look at you hardly. And today she's one of those. She's one of the pepper pots in the club. She's just got more zip in her zipper than ten kids. And uh, if you ever look into the eyes of Kevin or Nevin, you you, you never forget it. Those sweet, uh, big old eyeballs look back at you, and you say, "How you 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 have to be faithful. You have to 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 provide uh, the, the the information to them, and 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 multitudes like them. They're all over." Uh, you can't help but drive down the neighborhood and see boys and girls who need to hear about the Lord. And whether you can make a difference or not, you don't know, but you try. You do the best you can. And we, we drag them to the fun park. We uh, drag them down to, <laughs> to the uh, Diamond Gyms, uh, uh, drag them up to Chain of Lakes, I mean, for, for awards. And we're, the, uh, the big award for the next uh, two months is going to be a great big old... A uh, hayride, uh, and uh, uh, you know we don't realize we we, we know so much. We uh, Bill was taking uh, Nevin home the other night, and, and, and Nevin said, "What is a hayride?" I never forget that a ten-year-old never doesn't know what a hayride is. I mean, that's right. How, how would he know? I mean, he doesn't live on a farm. Back on a farm, those were common things. What's a hayride? You really ride on a hay wagon? You mean they, somebody pulls it? Yeah. <laughs> oh, boy, that sounds great and exciting. A tremendous idea. Who ever, never heard of it? Well, new experiences, wonderful opportunities, sharing with, with boys and girls. Okay, and uh, uh, giving information. I, uh, I, I know uh, uh, up at uh, the radio station and TV station where I uh, do that part-time work uh, to keep us on these stations here, uh, one of the men, uh, he uh, he'll drop some commercials off for me to do, and he he says uh, he says, uh, do you have a moose in here who can uh, can, uh, can do any uh, any commercials? Well, now where does he get that? Well, he's watching the kids' backyard Bible club where Matilda Moose comes on and she talks to Aunt Jan, and he you you don't know about Matilda Moose if you're not watching kids' backyard Bible club. I'll guarantee that. And uh, he just is so amazed that there's a moose that can talk. Uh, well, you know, uh, and he makes a big deal. We get a lot of kick out. We don't know who's listening. That's not our responsibility, is it? It's not our responsibility. Uh, uh, who's reading the books? The books are published, and the books are sent out as God provides. Now, we'll, we're the, the church, I, I have just one more chapter to finish. Uh, and I'm finished uh, with the notes on the church. Uh, Scott can then uh, scan it, correct all the typos, and uh, uh, put it in the uh, computer. It can be printed out, and we can distribute the doctrine of the church as its own booklet, and then later on it will become a part of the, uh, the appendix for the book on Galatians. But in the meantime, it can get out there to other people who who are confused as far as, as what the local church uh, is uh, concerned. But uh, outreach, uh, we have uh, booths every year at the Christ Child Festival. And while many evangelical churches uh, have uh, uh, totally and completely forgotten about it, uh, written it off, uh, uh, given it over to others, uh, and they, then they lament that uh, the cults take over things. And why, why, why? Because they aren't interested. Because it does take effort to put a, a couple of booths at the festival and to give up a couple of nights 
to man the booth and to stand there and hand out literature uh, again and again and again to people who come by, some of which is thrown on the ground, some of which is thrown in the, in the wastebasket, some of which is read, and all of the material we pass out contains gospel information. Uh, we have uh, tried other methods, and we're always open to any method that God will use uh, for us to outreach. In addition to that, we have in the local church... <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> Allergy is always two sneezes. Uh, it must be the heavy air out here tonight. But uh, the, uh, the responsibility of the church contributing funds uh, to uh, missionaries. Uh, we have a, a recent letter here from uh, Gary Horton. He, September is here. That means school doors are open again, as well as God's doors to thousands of kids in public schools. I love the thought that when kids go back to school, so do I. And there, we're, we support Gary Horton. As a matter of fact, some of the funds in the designated funds are for him when he comes to be with us. And uh, uh, we support Barton Browning. And uh, he's, uh, uh, he writes uh, in his letter, uh, I have more work to do than it seems possible. I wonder if it'll, I'll ever be able to face, uh, uh, finish all the work that needs to be done. But I can continue to turn out material in Spanish that will assist those who are searching uh, and so forth. Uh, we support uh, missionaries as the Lord makes these available around the world. So these are ways that the local church contributes to bona fide missionary evangelists uh, around the world. In addition to that, of course, we don't, uh, but the church can train its own personnel and, uh, prov uh, and send its own personnel uh, into uh, the world. And uh, while we didn't actually send Barbara, uh, uh, nevertheless, we do consider uh, that while she was working for uh, the, uh, the um, uh, Glen Haven Youth Ranch, that she was our uh, missionary. And uh, uh, we remembered uh, her on a regular uh, basis. But uh, uh, the majority of, of the work of evangelism is done up here by believers uh, in their individual witness uh, through uh, the power of the Holy Spirit to people in their world with whom they come in contact. And uh, 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 we're all a part of the fantastic team that uh, has the privilege and the opportunity for us. God the Holy Spirit works through individuals uh, and... Uh, uh, somewhere there is a person uh, who is uh, lost but is on positive volition at the point of God consciousness and God is preparing that person and he is preparing a believer over here to somehow take the gospel information and get it to that person wherever that person is at. The righteousness and the justice of God demands that he take and send someone with gospel information to the one who has that particular need. And uh, whether they will believe the first time or not is up to the free will and volition of that individual. Some people have to hear many times. Uh, I know Dr. Oswald Smith used to say, why should anyone hear twice before everyone has heard once? Well, that sounds like it's a very noble thing, but that isn't a necessarily... Uh, uh, a truism. The point is that we give out the gospel and uh, uh, everyone who must hear will hear because God is faithful to send that gospel to them. Can the church, his body, uh, are uh, the ones that he moves in order to uh, fulfill that basic principle? Well, that isn't the only purpose of the local church. It's just the first purpose of the local church. And we will continue with more of those on our, in our next class. We do thank you, loving Father, for the privilege and the honor of being your representatives here on this earth, of introducing men and women and boys and girls to the Lord Jesus Christ as their own personal Savior, the one who loved them and gave himself for them on the cross of Calvary, the one who said, I am come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. And as we note uh, a nation in which we live and a world in which we live, 
in which uh, uh, people uh, need desperately this kind of a message, may we be found faithful in our uh, local church uh, doing the work that you have called us to do. You have uh, brought us into existence to accomplish the things that you have provided before us, the open door you provided before us uh, for us to fulfill our responsibility to you and uh, introducing the world to the wonderful Savior. So uh, I commit our church to you, to our people, to those who are listening. May each one be concerned enough with his world to pass on the good news to every one in his world who is prepared by the Holy Spirit to hear it. In Jesus' name, amen. A priest has the person privately preparing himself for the study of the word, using rebound if necessary, bringing every thought into captivity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Once again, Heavenly Father, we pause to thank you for your matchless grace and for the institution of the unique organism known as the Church of our Lord Jesus Christ, his body, royal family of God, which is active in this dispensation to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ and accomplish his work. As we continue our study, may God the Holy Spirit use it as a challenge to each of us, I ask in Jesus' name, amen. In our last study, we began to look at some of the purposes for the church. And the first we have looked at was be, uh, has been to evangelize the world. And we went through that point by point, but I found in a, uh, a recent issue of Focus on the Family magazine an interesting illustration. I was talking about the fact that every believer is responsible to be uh, involved in evangelism. The g spiritual gift of evangelism uh, is given to certain people, but those are really missionaries. The spiritual gift of evangelism is for missionaries, but all believers have the responsibility to evangelize. That is, to give out the gospel, to witness for our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, this is an interesting story that uh, came to me and I thought it would be interesting to you. A few years ago I heard a compelling story about two people whose lives were changed forever because one of them dared to take a risk. It occurred at a neighborhood grocery store where a woman named Debbie had shopped for several years. Through the course of time she became friends with the employees, many of whom were like an extended family to her. An older man named Jack was particularly kind and would often bag her groceries and take them to her car for her. He became an adopted grandparent to her children and they always looked forward to their weekly trips to see him. But the personal touch of a small store could not compete with the low prices and huge selection of a huge new supermarket that had recently moved into the community. One day when Debbie arrived at the store she saw the windows covered with butcher paper and a hand-lettered hand -lettered sign announcing its imminent closure. Jack was sitting on a bench outside the market, dejected and disappointed over the turn of events. It suddenly occurred to Debbie that while she was shopping, that she might never see Jack again. Somewhere between the frozen foods and the produce section, she thought she heard the Holy Spirit speaking to her, you have never told Jack about me. Debbie realized that this might be her last opportunity to see Jack and her last chance to tell him about Jesus Christ. For several moments, she debated. She thought of many reasons why she could not share her faith. This isn't a good time. This is an inappropriate place. Jack has not made choices about his religious beliefs. I don't want to offend him. I wouldn't know what to say. All of them seemed valid arguments but she couldn't shake the undeniable prompting of the Spirit. When Debbie emerged from the market, Jack was still sitting on the bench. 
She walked over to him and set her bags on the ground. Jack, we have known each other for a long time, she began. We feel like you're a part of our family, and we know that you care about us, too. But I'm not sure how often we're going to see each other in the future, and there's something I need to say to you. Jack was listening and nodding his head. I realized this morning that I have never told you about the most important relationships in my life, Debbie explained slowly. She continued for a few minutes telling her older friend about Jesus' death on the cross, his resurrection, and its implications for mankind and the life she enjoyed as a believer. The more she talked, the easier it became to share her faith. When she was finished, she asked Jack if he had ever believed on Christ. No one has ever explained it to me, he responded. Would you like to accept Jesus as your Savior, she asked with boldness. Yes, I would, he said. Jack repeated Debbie's words as she uttered the sinner's prayer of repentance. When they lifted their heads, tears were flowing down their cheeks. I suppose the busy shoppers going in and out of the market may have thought that Jack was mourning the loss of his job, but he was crying with joy over the discovery of a new life in Christ. It was an unlikely place for a conversion experience. There was no altar, no choir, no preacher, not even a Bible. There was simply a woman who obeyed God's call as a sinner. We often think that we must be evangelists in order to lead others to Christ. But the, uh, Paul reminds us to, in 2 Timothy 4, 5, to do the work of an evangelist. While some may have the spiritual gift of evangelism and naturally excel at it, Paul's exhortation suggests that we should all be engaged in the task of leading lost soul to the Lord. Certainly Debbie did not have the gift to be an evangelist. She simply had the courage to try. And I think that's a good illustration of what I was talking about when I talked about each of us has a world to whom we are sent. And we have that responsibility to evangelize that world. The second purpose of the church, it may be the first, but uh, uh, to glorify God. Uh, uh, if you'll take your Bible, we'll look at a few passages. Let's turn uh, to Romans chapter 15.